This is David Aikman, author and former journalist with Time magazine. Does God exist? Does the cosmos have an all-powerful, infinitely intelligent creator? For centuries, scientists and philosophers have debated this fundamental question to no avail. But now, in this reality show about reality itself, a team of renowned explorers make a historic breakthrough. Their quest takes us from the fiery birth of the cosmos to the inexplicable genesis of life on planet Earth, and finally, the sudden appearance of self-conscious, language-using Homo sapiens. Each participant is a celebrity in his own right. Each brings a unique perspective. They are indeed some of the world's foremost authorities on the interface of science and religion. A highlight of the show is a series of astonishing pronouncements from the best-known academic atheist of the past 50 years, Professor Anthony Flew of England. Over the decades, he has published over 30 books attacking belief in God and debated a wide range of religious believers, starting with C.S. Lewis in Oxford. But in our show, Flew makes a startling turnaround. In 1950, Professor Flew set the agenda for atheism with his Theology and Falsification, a paper whose content was first presented in a debate with C.S. Lewis. This work was reportedly the most widely reprinted philosophical publication of the last half century. Among Professor Flew's 30-plus books are The Presumption of Atheism, Atheistic Humanism, Darwinian Evolution, and A Rational Animal. Of reason, uh, which I think Dr. Warren uh, wished and expected. Well, let's review once more uh, what that supporting reason is. And the first step is a matter of method. And it consists in arguing that the right starting point is what I have indeed elsewhere called the Stratonician presumption or the presumption of atheism. Flew's main objections. Number one, the eternal universe well, certainly I do. Um, am inclined to believe that the universe was without beginning and will be without end. Indeed, I know no good reasons for um, uh, disputing either of these suggestions. Number two, life as a random process. Certainly, I do believe that um, uh, 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 living organisms evolved over an immeasurably long period of time from non-living. And number three, the idea that God is a self-contradiction. I know there is no God. The second thing which I need to say is I know that people feel, not only Dr. Warren, that I've not really been offering any reasons for being an atheist. I'm afraid I think that I have. I mean, you may well think they're not good enough, but I think that I have. In the um, first uh, in the two things that I've been saying about the first stage in any systematic apologetic. <clears throat> if, after all, the things that are said about this proposed being are contradictory, then to say that there is such a being, thus and thus described, is like saying there's a round square or an unmarried husband. And if this is so, this is a frightfully good reason for saying there's no such thing. It's exactly the sort of reason we have for saying there's no such thing as a married bachelor and so on. The subject of our show is what might be called the new story of science. The launching pad is New York University in New York City. Professor Flew is joined by Dr. Gerald Schroeder from Israel, and Dr. John Haldane from Scotland. The MIT-trained Schroeder, who taught at MIT in Boston and the Weizmann Institute and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, is the author of the bestseller, The Science of God. His most recent work is The Hidden Face of God, How Science Reveals the Ultimate Truth. Haldane is professor of philosophy at St. Andrews University, Scotland, and the author of numerous publications on science, philosophy and religion. He delivered the Stanton Lectures at Cambridge University and was scheduled to deliver the famous Gifford Lectures in 2005. His widely publicized debate on the existence of God with J.J.C. Smart 
was published by Oxford University Press as Atheism and Theism. The setting for our show is the cosmos as a whole. The liftoff date is May 7, 2004. Our explorers are the thinkers joining us here, and our journey takes us to the origins of the universe, life, and humankind. Where did the universe, the longest running reality show, come from? How did life and reproduction and consciousness emerge? What gave rise to our minds, to our ability to conceptualize and understand and use language? Are we intruders in the universe who will be voted off or fired? Or are we meant to be here? And what does modern science tell us about all this? This reality show is truly about reality. In fact, it is about the ultimate reality, which is another name for God. Our starting point is the new story of science, the discovery of the progressive increase in the IQ of the universe. The IQ of the universe has progressed. In this chart, from the beginning of time until today, time is represented by the horizontal axis, IQ by huge steps on the vertical axis. We know today that the history of the universe is a story of quantum leaps of intelligence, the sudden yet systematic appearance of intrinsically intelligent systems arranged in an ascending order. In relatively rapid succession, we see the coming into existence of the physical universe, then of life, then of consciousness, and finally of mind. The IQ of the universe is evident all around us. The genetic code, the periodic table, relativity and quantum physics, photosynthesis and symbiosis, and innumerable laws and codes and constants form an infrastructure of intelligence supporting our everyday world. Schroeder describes findings that information is the most basic hard fact of the universe. What we do find here is that the universe may in fact be composed of information. That is to say that this fundamental stuff of the universe is in fact information itself. The universe had a high IQ from the beginning. Vast arrays of ingenious laws and precise mathematical constants are already in place before the birth of the cosmos. Then, some 14 billion years ago, an energy field mysteriously burst into being, generating hundreds of billions of galaxies and stars. The fact is, if we look at the expansion of the universe, and we see that day by day the universe gets larger and the data from the Hubble telescope and the Keck, as I mentioned before, in Hawaii give us data of the universe expanding and stretching. So if the universe is getting bigger and larger by day, the scale of the universe is the proper terminology. If we run the equation back in time, we can't go back in time physically, but mathematically we certainly can. What happens is eventually the space between all particles reduces to essentially zero, that would be the creation, the Big Bang, the creation of the universe, the moment of the, which our universe comes into being. So we, the data imply that there was a beginning to our universe. And the question is what we have, we can't see outside or before the universe, but the, the question would remain then, is this a willful act or not? Around nine billion years later, planet Earth is formed. What is puzzling at this stage is the sudden appearance of life. Dr. Schroeder thinks this is stunning. Life starts, not after billions of years, but it's geologically speaking, Im immediately. Now, obviously there's a slack there of several millions of years, but the oldest rocks that can bear fossils already have fossils of fully formed, single-celled life. Nature invents photosynthesis in a snap and starts oxygenating the atmosphere. And may, uh, you know, the rapidity is what's the, uh, the surprise. Many of us were taught that scientists believed that life arose from a sort of primordial biological soup. Could life have risen from random reactions? The late Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, who described himself as an agnostic inclined towards atheism, argued very clearly that the chances are so small as to be negligible that the long polymer molecules that sustain life 
could have been assembled by random processes from the chemical units of which they are made. Moreover, in geological terms, life appeared immediately after the Earth had cooled down. To explain this sudden emergence of living organisms, the agnostic Crick suggested that life may have been deliberately planted on Earth. Of course, in this explanation, Crick neatly avoids telling us planted by whom or what. Schroeder claims that the idea that life is a product of random reactions is no longer taken seriously by most scientists. Harold Morowitz in his book, Energy Flow and Biology, computed that merely to create a single bacterium would require more time than the universe might ever see if chance random combinations of its molecules were the only driving force. Life could not have started by chance. Since 1979, you will have to find, search far and wide to find in a review journal, in a peer-reviewed journal, an article that relates the origin of life to pure random reactions. Some thinkers, including Stephen Hawking, have argued that a horde of monkeys typing on a computer long enough could produce one of Shakespeare's sonnets. They then apply the analogy to claim that life could have originated from random reactions given enough time. The New Yorker, in the uh, Christmas New Year issue of 2002, going to, on to 2003, was so impressed by the likelihood that this could happen that in fact it devoted its cover to the monkeys producing one of Shakespeare's sonnets. And you see the monkeys here hammering away, bing bing, this one's not too happy, this one's really unhappy. But then over here in the corner, you get a real happy monkey. He got it. He got, he got the, uh, the sonnet. Now, it's interesting to go through the numbers to see how that works, but it's so accepted that a year or so, well, the, the, New, the, London, the Times of London, Friday, the 9th of May, 2003, it has an article, Much Ado, but monkeys fail the Shakespeare's test. Monkeys fail, so what's the uh. Much Ado? The National Council of, of Arts and Arts was convinced to give a several, a 2,000 sterling, pounds sterling, Arts Council sponsorship to a project in which a computer would be placed in a monkey cage with six monkeys. Okay, you got to get there. So they get this. They got. They put the keyboard. I don't think they put the whole computer in because that'd be too dangerous. They probably put the, the keyboard in and, and shielded the wires and had the wire to go out out off, off out of the cage into a where the readout would be. It stayed in there for a month. They produced about fifty pages of hammering away. But the article is very interesting because the uh, the person, this woman that was in charge of the article when when writing this up for the interview said it was very quite amazing and quite disgusting, in fact, how the experiment worked. First of all, when the monkeys were confronted by the computer, they tried to eat it. Then that didn't work, so they used it as a toilet, which she said was a real problem because she was the one in charge of cleaning up the mess afterwards. But they produced 50 pages without a single word, without a single word present they pr of all this typing. So how can that be? I mean, how can it possibly be? I mean, the shortest word in the English language is one letter. So they must have hit an A or an I, even if it wasn't capitalized, you know, from time to time. But of course that wouldn't be a word, would it? Supposing you have Z, Q, W, A, V, W, the A isn't a word. What you have to have for the word to be randomly produced is spacebar, A, spacebar. In other words, even a one letter word requires three acts in sequence, space, A, space. To, to isolate the A from the other lines of gibberish that are coming out. If you think there were, let's say, 30, 25, I mean, probably about 30, 35 uh, key positions on the computer, there's probably more, but just pulling a number 30 out of the air, the, the 26 languages plus space bars plus, plus the at symbol, the number, let's say 30 or possibly closer to 40. Well, the likelihood of getting that letter then is 30 times 30 times 30. Well, 30 times 30 is 900 times another 30 is, is 27,000. The likelihood of getting a one letter word by random pump typing is one chance out of 27,000. What's the likelihood of getting a Shakespeare sonnet? Now, I wouldn't use this as a parallel for life, but that's what we get out of the most widely sold science book ever written, The Brief History of Time. What's the likelihood of getting a Shakespeare sonnet by hammering away. Well, you know, I went to MIT, so I'm not supposed to know too much about sonnets, and I don't, but I knew enough to learn where to look. Shakespeare's complete works. 
All the sonnets are the same length. They're by definition 14 lines long. I picked the one that I knew the opening line for. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day or evening? I don't even know. In any event, I counted the number of letters. There are 488 letters in that sonnet. 488 letters. What's the likelihood for getting spaces? What's the likelihood of hammering away and getting 488 letters in the exact sequence that uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's eve? What? What's, and then going on through this. Well, the likelihood of, let's say it's S-H-A-L-L. So if you had a bag with 26 letters in it, you reach in and you want to pull out an S, the likelihood is one chance out of 26. If you have two bags, each with 26 letters, and I want to get S-H because I'm going to S-H-A-L-L, shall I, shall, 26, one out of 26 for the first bag, one out of 26 for the second, so that's 26 times 26. The A, one out of 26, keep adding, adding. What you end up is 26 multiplied by itself 488 times. Or, in other words, 26 to the 488th power. Or, in other words, in base 10, 10 to the 690th. The number of particles in the universe, not grains of sand, I mean particles of protons, neutrons, electron, muons, is about 10 to the, 10 to the 80th. We're talking about 10 to the 600th. That's uh, 10 to the 80th. There's one with 80 zeros after it. 10 to the 690th is one with 690 zeros after it. There is not enough particles in the universe to write down all the trials. You'd be off by a factor of 10 to the 600th. If you if you took the entire universe and converted it into computer chips, the universe weighs approximately 10 to the 55th grams, mass energy. So 10 to the 55th, 10 to the 56th. So we'll take 100 universes, 1,000 universes, 10 to the 60th, huge, multiple massive universe, which cannot be that heavy, because it would have collapsed on itself immediately, and turn that entire universe, not just the Earth, the entire universe, forget the monkeys, into computer chips, each one weighing a millionth of a gram, and have each computer chip able to spin out 488 trials, let's say, a million times a second, which is about the speed, because eventually you get the problem of just transferring of information to run this out. If you turn the entire computer chip universe into these microcomputer chips, and the computer chips were, sp were spinning a million times a second, a sonnet, a sonnet, a sonnet, but random letters, the number of trials you would get since the beginning of time would be 10 to, 10 to the 90th trials. It's off again by a factor of 10 to the 600th. You will never get a sonnet by chance. The unit would have to be 10 to the 600th times larger. That's a billion, 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 until you get to the 600 times larger or or older by 10 to the billion, billion, billion. It doesn't happen. Yet the world just thinks, what's the problem? We'll get the universe. We'll get the, you know, the monkeys can do it every time. Schroeder emphasizes the point that we know when life arose, but not how. The universe is tuned for life. Not tuned for the starting of life. That's not at all clear. There's, we don't have any idea at the moment how, their, how life started. Speculations yet? Yes, but how inert matter became alive, that's a complete unknown at the moment. However, once life gets started, we see clearly from the fundamental con con constants of the universe that, in fact, the universe is tuned for life. Every living being, from the first bacterium to the largest dinosaur, is an autonomous agent that generates energy, reproduces and processes information using an incredibly intelligent symbol processing system, DNA. Life is a manifestation of intelligence written in the language of DNA. DNA is the computer software that constructs and maintains cells, determines the sequence of amino acids in every protein, and contains the genetic information transmitted to future generations. DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated into proteins. Proteins are just as fascinating as DNA. Proteins have the extraordinary ability to assemble themselves without external intervention. Every cell in the body, other than sex and blood cells, makes 2,000 proteins every second from hundreds of amino acids. To repeat, this happens every second. But this process is so complex, says Scientific American, that a supercomputer programmed with the rules for protein folding would take 10 to the power of 127 years to generate the final folded form of a single protein with just 100 amino acids. 
And yet, what takes a supercomputer trillions of years takes seconds for real proteins. Note that life was fully formed when it first appeared, with all its essential properties, from DNA and proteins to replication. What about the origin of species? For three billion years, life remains single-celled, and then out of the blue, what comes what's called the Cambrian Explosion. This is Time Magazine, Scientific American talks about it also, in the terminology, the Big Bang of Animal Evolution. The Big Bang of Animal Evolution is quite amazing. Every, it's described quite succinctly in Scientific American, that every phylum that exists today came into being simultaneously. There are approximately 34 animal phyla. Every, all of those 34 appear in the, in the fossil record in a, in a strata called the Cambrian Explosion. Simply, here's Chordacta. That's, uh, that's our first formation in our phylum. It's primitive fish. These are the first in insects, the trilobites. And they are mollusks and all, all together, all the 34, appear out of the blue. 3.8 billion years ago, 3.6, 3.7 approximately, 3.8 billion years ago, water forms, life begins. For 3 billion years, life remains one cell. Then out of the blue, the Cambrian explosion produces this menagerie of life. It is not simply the simultaneous appearance of all the animal body plans that is striking. Suddenly, the most basic form of consciousness, eyesight, visual consciousness, emerges across the board. In that life, already are eyes. Every phylum that has eyes today appeared in the fossil record for the first time with eyes. In seeing, a mechanical stimulus is transformed into a nerve signal that is sent to the brain and then converted into a conscious state. Despite decades of scientific study, the bridge between these two worlds, the external stimulus and the corresponding sense perception, remains as much a mystery today as ever. The philosopher Karl Popper noted that the emergence of consciousness in the animal kingdom is perhaps as great a mystery as the origin of life. A central mystery in origin of life studies is the origin of reproduction. In his book, What Remains to be Discovered, Sir John Maddox, the editor emeritus of the journal Nature, noted, the overriding question is when and how sexual reproduction itself evolved. Despite decades of speculation, we do not know. And yet, reproduction is almost always overlooked in origin discussions. But in this show, it is a key part of the plot. Because what we've got to try to explain is how it is we get from uh, inanimate, lifeless matter, which does not reproduce itself, to a situation of entities that do. Because reproduction brings onto the scene something that wasn't there before. Well, what they're going to have to try to do is say that what preceded uh, reproduction was sufficient, was enough to get reproduction going, but wasn't itself reproduction. Because, of course, if it was itself reproduction, then we've just pushed the question one stage back. We're back to that old regress problem. We're trying to explain the origins of reproduction, and so we can't explain the origins of reproduction in terms of things that are already reproducing. So what people will start to say are things like this. Well, we've got maybe proto-reproduction. That is to say, we've got certain chemical-physical reactions that are not themselves reproductive, but they're on their way to being reproductive. But this really isn't an explanation, it's just a cheat. The fact of the matter is, either we've got reproduction or we haven't got reproduction. If we have reproduction, we don't seem to be able to explain it out of something that isn't already reproducing. Uh, and if we have reproduction already, then we haven't yet explained it. The very first forms of life that reach us today already had to have the ability of reproduction. Mm -hmm. Reproduction is purpose-driven. Reproduction isn't, isn't casual. The idea of reproduction, reproduction the purpose-driven of preserving the species and moving it forward. Mm -hmm. So already the, these forms of life had purpose behind them, which indicates something fairly significant. So why should, now why would early life even have considered, as it was in quotes, considered reproduction? If you didn't know you were going to die, why bother worried about reproduction? Humans happen to know that at the end of the, you know, at the end of the, at the end of this, this chapter, there's an end. It's called death. That may not be the end of life, but death is the end of the chapter of this aspect of life. Well, why would the early first forms of, speech of life have thought of this? I mean, did they know they were going to die? Did, bacteri did a bacterium know it was going to die? 
Finally, our journey brings us to ourselves, the new race of self-conscious language users. The next origin question is so ingrained in our daily lives that we never give it a second thought. Consider what you've been doing up to this point. You've been watching this program and its participants and weighing their arguments. They've been talking to you with certain codes we call language, and you've been decoding their linguistic symbols to understand what they are trying to say. So we ask, how did language arise, and how did we acquire the capacity to use it? The atheist evolutionist Richard Dawkins says quite bluntly, there doesn't seem to be anything like syntax in non-human animals, and it is hard to imagine evolutionary forerunners of it. Equally obscure is the origin of semantics, of words and their meanings. Further, we ask, who does the understanding when we hear someone? Is it your brain cells, or is it you? And where are you located? In some part of your brain, or elsewhere in your body? Harvard brain scientist Steven Pinker said in How the Mind Works, the I is not a combination of body parts or brain states or bits of information, but a unity of selfness over time, a single locus that is nowhere in particular. How did language and conceptual thought arise? Language is a system of codes that conveys meaning through symbols. The activities of coding and decoding, of seeing meaning, are irreducibly immaterial. Syntactical language is unique to human beings, found even in ancient civilizations and instinctively mastered by children at a very young age. But scientists cannot explain the origin of language or the jump from primitive to syntactical language. The nature of language um, as the expression of conceptual thought calls for an explanation that is ultimately only going to be available if there is an intrinsic source of mindedness that in creating beings communicates that ability, that intellectual ability or power uh, to those beings. So how do we account for the IQ of the universe? Many of the greatest scientists of all time, from Newton to Einstein to Heisenberg, found it inconceivable that a purely material matrix, formless and randomized, can generate undeniable intelligence. In their view, the intelligence of the universe, its laws, points to an intelligence that has no limitation, a superior mind, as Einstein put it. Certain it is a conviction, akin to a religious feeling, of the rationality or intelligibility of the world lies behind all scientific work of a higher order. This firm belief, a belief bound up with a deep feeling and a superior mind that reveals itself in the world of experience, represents my conception of God. As they saw it, only an infinitely intelligent mind, the mind of God, can serve as a source of energy, life, consciousness and rationality and the laws of nature. Underlying the IQ of the universe is the God matrix. This was for them the summit of scientific discovery. In other words, of all the great discoveries of modern science, the greatest is God. Now, of course, this is not a conviction shared by all scientists and philosophers. And certainly there are obstacles facing the God hypothesis, the existence of evil and imperfection, for instance. Many people assume that intelligence in the universe somehow evolved out of non-intelligence, given chance and enough time, and in the case of living beings, through a natural selection and random mutation. But even in the most hard-headed and materialistic scenario, intelligence and intelligence systems come fully formed from day one. Matter, mass energy, came with all its intricate, ingenious, mathematically precise laws from the time it first appeared. Life came fully formed with the incredibly intelligent symbol processing of DNA, the astonishing phenomenon of protein folding, and the marvel of replication from its very first appearance. Language, the incarnation of conceptual thought with its inexplicable structure of syntax, symbols, and semantics, appeared out of the blue, again with its essential infrastructure as is from day one. 
The evidence we have shows unmistakably that there was no progressive, gradual evolution of non-intelligence into intelligence in any of the fundamental categories of energy, life, or mind. Each one of the three had intrinsically intelligent structures from the time each first appeared. Each, it would seem, proceeds from an infinitely intelligent mind in a precise sequence. This is the conclusion to which the origin events point. Three points um, that uh, merit attention. First of all, the uh, transition from inanimate matter, lifeless matter, uh, to life. Uh, secondly, uh, the movement from life as such up to the level of sentient or conscious life, the kind of uh, state of existence that's enjoyed both by animals and by human beings. But then thirdly, the higher level of existence, intellectual existence, that's exhibited uh, by human beings uh, when, for example, they do such things as engage in talking about philosophy uh, and science. In an effort to avoid the obvious answer that the source of life, consciousness and thought has to be living, conscious and thinking, some thinkers simply point to a mysterious phenomenon called emergence. But this attempt simply misses the whole point. What some people have wanted to say is this. Well, uh, over um, the history of the universe, what's happened is that when uh, matter gets to a certain level of complexity, there emerges this uh, a further level. So matter becomes organized in certain ways, and then that leads um, to life. Life pops up, as it were, gets added to the stack. And then when life, biological properties reach a certain level of, of complexity, then consciousness arises up out of that. And then again, at certain level of complexity, consciousness uh, gives rise to um, intellect. But these metaphors of giving rise to, or of emerging out of, or producing and so on, aren't really an explanation. They're just a description of the thing that needs to be explained. So, what does Anthony Flew think of the new story of science? This will be our concern in the next segment. Let's return to Flew's main objections. Number one, the eternal universe. Number two, life as a random process. And number three, the idea that God is a self-contradiction. My point is that all questions about the truth of Dr. Warren's system and all questions about the truth of any of the innumerable rival accounts of powers and purposes behind and above the universe should start with the presumption of atheism. And the presumption of atheism, like the presumption of innocence in the British common law, concerns the burden of proof. It's not an assumption that something is the case, it's a thesis about the burden of proof. It is the claim that if we are rationally to proceed above and behind the universe to some story about the supernatural and the transcendent, then we need to have some positive good reason to believe in this story. If we're going to go behind and beyond what's common to all sensible people of any religion or of none, then we need some good reason for making whatever bold conjecture it is proposed that we should make. What does he think today of the origin of the universe? The Big Bang Theory relates to this, to the, such an existence of, of ordered intelligence in the world. Where I and my lot uh, do differ from all the others is that we reject the whole idea of any transcendent reality behind or above the universe. We start and stop with what is common to all men of all religions and none. That is to say, we start and stop with the universe itself, with the everyday world of common sense and common experience, and with those hidden mechanisms of that world uh, which are progressively revealed by the advance of science. And we reject all transcendent supernatural systems not because we've examined or could have examined each in turn, but because it does not seem to us that there is any good evidencing reason to postulate anything behind or beyond this natural universe. The, when I uh, 
uh, first met the Big Bang Theory as an unbeliever, it seemed to me this made a big difference uh, because um, uh, this did at least suggest that the universe had a beginning and hence uh, that the first <laughs> sentence in the book of Genesis is uh, related to an event in the universe. You know, if there had been no reason to think that the universe had a beginning, there would have been no need to postulate something else which produced the whole thing. Uh, but because it had a beginning, the question of what produced this beginning becomes a, an entirely sensible and almost inevitable one to ask. So that very greatly changed the situation from the one which I was confronted with in the 1930s or 40s and 50s. What happened before the Big Bang? Some cosmologists today speculate that our universe may be one of numerous other universes. But this doesn't solve the problem, as Flew points out. Because if the existence of one universe requires explanation, the explicit and the multiplicity of universes requires a much bigger explanation. You know, the problem has increased by a factor of whatever is the total number of universes. What about Flew's views on the origin of life? Matter. Uh, well, yes, certainly, I do believe that um, uh, 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 living organisms evolved over an immeasurably long period of time from non-living. And let's um, take some examples. Uh, let's consider the inordinate complexity of the human eye and then say, who made it all? Well, um, if you uh, just look, consider the most obviously available evidence, the answer is uh, no one made it, it growed. Uh, about the reproductive system, I'm a bit surprised to find Dr. Warren talking about the human reproductive system. I know it's all a bit fashionable in the presidential debates and all that, but um, uh, after all, the human reproductive system is not the right thing to refer to if you want to say men, uh, so to speak, couldn't appear without special creation. It's to refer to the way in which we all know that human beings do refer, uh, do appear. Uh, and uh, if uh, special creation involved, it was a long time ago. But, you know, immediately human beings appear in a way that's all too familiar and which we describe as the facts of life. Professor Flew, in your view, does modern science indicate the existence of an outside uh, intelligent, active in this universe? Yes, I now think it does, um, almost entirely of, uh, because of the um, uh, DNA investigations. Uh, what, what I think that the DNA material has done has shown by its quite almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which uh, lead to produce uh, this being. Uh, that uh, intelligence must have been involved in uh, getting these uh, extraordinarily diverse elements of, um, uh, to work together. You know, it's an enormous complexity of the, is the, the number of elements, but an enormous subtlety of the ways they work together. It's only, uh, you know, the, uh, the chance of them meeting uh, meeting the, the, the two parts at uh, the right time is simply minute. That's, that's the best I can do for a short explanation. It is all, in my view, a matter of the enormous uh, complexity by which the results are achieved, which look to me like uh, the work of intelligence. Professor Flew agrees that reproduction poses a problem. I don't know that anyone has offered any sort of theory, a virtually insoluble problem, uh, which, of course, um, uh, makes it suitable material for an argument to design. Those who argue that life originated from random reactions sometimes use the analogy of monkeys typing on a computer. Flew is not impressed with this argument. But I think you 
have um, very, very satisfactorily and decisively established that the, uh, uh, what we might call the monkey, monkey theorem is a load of rubbish. I mean, it's particularly good to do it with just a mere sonnet. <laughs> and if it's absolutely absurd for, for that, then a more elaborate feat to be achieved by chance is simply, it's absurd to suggest it. The sudden appearance of different forms of life is also puzzling. Of one of the articles in uh, the journal Science, many articles like this, this is from 1995 by, by Robert Kerr. Did Darwin get it all right? Now, I never thought I would see in the peer-reviewed, extraordinarily highly respected journal Science, and then the subtitle is essentially, not essentially, the subtitle is no, that species appear with an, a highly undarwinian-like rapidity. That's the journal Science, peer-reviewed. And that's the basic problem, isn't it, Professor? Mm, yeah. That suddenly you have these, these explosions of life, and they seem to come literally out of the blue. Flew agrees that the origin questions lead to the idea of an intelligent mind at work in the universe. Reflecting upon what is known and studied in science and so on does drive the mind in the direction, well, as I say, either of saying, well, we simply can't explain it, there is no explanation, all these discontinuous changes, there's no explanation, or there is an explanation, purposeful agency. I don't know whether or not what Anthony feels yes. about that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult to avoid this conclusion, I think. Number three. We come now to the question of the nature of God. In the past, Flew said that the idea of God as omnipresent spirit makes no sense. Now, um, uh, someone says that um, uh, they believe that there is a being all-powerful and so on, personal and so on. Uh, and of course, this being is immeasurably greater than human beings, and of course, it's incorporeal. Uh, well now, um, uh, how do we um, uh, point out, how do we pick out as a subject of discourse um, the object that we are saying has these characteristics? Um, uh, one way, of course, of doing it would be to say, oh well, of course, these characteristics, you know, infinite power and so on, do not belong to any um, uh, particular thing in the universe. You know, we're not saying that something over there has all these. This would be ridiculous. Of course, we're not saying that. Um, uh, well, we're really saying it about the whole universe. But now, this move, which has been made by some, is clearly unacceptable to Christians, because this is a pantheist move. So one says, oh well, it, uh, we're not saying this about um, any particular thing in the universe, or about the universe as a whole. We're saying it about something outside the universe. Well, um, <laughs> yes, um, I can see What's being said about something, my difficulty is to see um, um, to what as I've got to attach these remarks as the subject. You know, what are these things being said about? I mean, it's all very well saying, oh well, they're being said about God. Yes, well, of course, one knew that, but um, how does one pick out this subject, indicate um, uh, what it is which ones, about which one's wanting to say the various things. What does Flew now think of the idea that God is self-contradictory? I think that perhaps um, a way of approaching this would be to think about what we mean when we say that somebody um, has effects. I mean, it might be said, for example, of a major uh, American corporation that their uh, influence reaches throughout the world. Yeah. Now, I think you would have to be naive to suppose that what that meant was that somehow, literally, there was extending out from the headquarters in New York or something mm -hmm. of that sort, these sort of tentacles. What we would mean when we said that their influence reached out throughout the world was that those people in that office in New York, let's say, could bring about effects uh, throughout the world. Yeah. They could, for example, by investing in shares or divesting of shares, 
have effects on the economy of remote parts of the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So what we're really saying is that they're, they're present, their influence is present, not by their being there, but by their effects being yes. there. So the understanding of God's omnipresence, it seems to me, should be uh, given in the following way, that to say that God is omnipresent throughout nature is not to say that God is spatially present throughout nature, but to say there is no part of the cosmos that is beyond God's influence, mm -hmm. that God's effects are everywhere in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, does that help at all? I think it does extremely well, yes. Yes, I think oh. that. <laughs> Some success there. Yeah, oh, right? uh, oh, absolutely, yes. Flew makes the significant admission that the existence of evil does not disprove the existence of God. I'm not sure that either party uh, should um, uh, make the whole question of the existence of God depend on this unwarranted or warranted evil. According to Schroeder, nature in fact gives some indication of God's interest in us. Author Roy Varghese joins the panel. Yeah. If God then is interested enough in the universe having wound up the energy forces then to force that to become alive. So there's a step further and suddenly we have an involvement Mm -hmm. in this creator beyond the Big Bang creation. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, we've been running on the energy for the last 15 billion years of one puff called the Big Bang, and that's it. But when we see this type of emergence, that, yeah. the, that the graphite and the paper comes together and somehow uh, etching uh, the outline for an, uh, uh, a drawing is, uh, appears, then something is present in the universe that goes beyond the creation. And then that possibly makes it more difficult to have the concept of an uninterested God. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you see, first you get the idea, God can just run the universe. Puts the universe online, it goes, then it steps yeah. back. Then suddenly we find this great, tremendous problem of getting life and reproduction. So you say, okay, so God had the interest in starting the universe, and now God, for some reason, has an interest in starting life within the universe. So now we've got God further downstream in the universe yeah. and more intimately involved. It becomes more difficult to extract that concept now from God being active in the life it created. Because God, if you take life as being an emergent property that would not be predicted by looking at the properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons, which you wouldn't. Yeah. Yet one mixture gives you a grain of sand, and the other gives you a mixture. The identical protons and neutrons give you a, a nine, the brain of an Einstein, and one gives you a lump of sand. So clearly this, there's, there is this emergent reality. So now you've gotten God so intimately connected with the universe, having, let's say, started life, even if it's just bacteria. Mm -hmm. but hard to see how it goes beyond them. It's just, just simple life. Well, now we know that God's interested in the universe beyond just winding it up. So now, now the fingerprint is there. Does that imply almost, almost a necessity to assume then that God is actually interested in the life that it made? Clearly, this thing we call God was interested in the universe enough to make it become alive. Now, now is that the end? Or can we take that step which demonstrates an interest beyond just making the universe and then almost forces to say, well now, having started life, now is God is interested in, in that life. I mean, God, the f some enervating force was interested enough to get reproductive organisms to come to be, which you'd never predict from protons, neutrons, and electrons, let alone light beams, but that is what happened. So can we always force the understanding of another step beyond that, that then God is interested in in is the origin of life a form of self-revelation? No, oh, I see this as a powerful argument. I don't see any way to meet that argument at the moment. Science cannot tell us about the God of faith, but our concern in this show is the IQ of the universe and what this tells us about its origin. On this matter, our journey has finally reached a destination. The stars of our show have reached a consensus with the pioneers of modern science. Our smart universe manifests an infinite intelligence, an ultimate reality. In fact, the greatest discovery of modern science is God. And this is David Aikman. The Wonder of the World, a journey from modern science to the mind of God by Roy Abraham Varghese, is the companion volume to Has Science Discovered God? Wonder is a dialogue between an atheist scientist and a theistic thinker on the existence of God and has been endorsed by Nobel Prize winners and other noted scholars, including Professor Anthony Flew, who remarked that, I was hugely impressed and substantially challenged by it. 
In Wonder, you will find a comprehensive overview of these origin questions, the science-religion insights of great scientists, and the thesis that the God equation underlies modern science. Varghese was previously co-editor of Cosmos Bias Theos, a work described in Time magazine as, quote, the year's most intriguing book about God, unquote.